Very excited that we have John Curtley, the chairman of Step Up for Students, uh, a school choice organization in Florida, here with us. Uh, he's going to talk about our new uh, study uh, called School Choice Regulations, Red Tape or Red Herring. We had a great event about this study on Monday. John was supposed to participate, but alas, some fog in D.C. kept him from doing so. Uh, what this study finds is that private schools actually are not uh, that worried about testing and accountability requirements of voucher and tax credit uh, programs, that the places that do require private schools to take state tests and to report the results, that doesn't seem to be a major deterrent, at least not for most of the schools, compared to some of the other uh, regulations that do deter them. So uh, in this conversation, we're going to talk about those school choice regulations and whether they are a red tape or a red herring. So John, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be with you, at least uh, by, by computer, if not in person. That's right. The, the <laughs> magic of Skype. All right. Well, uh, so, John, as, as you know, what we found was that uh, that regulations, though a concern for some schools that consider participating in, in these voucher or tax credit programs, there there's some concern, but they weren't the foremost concern that schools had. Was that a surprise to you? Not exactly, although I, I had a slightly different take uh, than your report based upon my experience, certainly in Florida and in, in some other states as well. And your, your report it had a very complicated formula, which I don't really understand in, 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 in the appendix. But uh, the, the gist of it was that uh, if you are a Catholic school, then you are much less likely to be concerned about the regulations and testing and, and, and other aspects. But if you're a non-Catholic school, then you, you're, you're likely to be more concerned about that. And, and I, I, I have a different experience in Florida. In, in my experience, and we have, we have in Florida now uh, about 1,500 schools, private schools, that are signed up to take the kids in, in a, under the tax credit program. And almost 1,300 actually do take them. Some are still waiting to take them, hoping to take them. So we have, we have a pretty good data set. And what we have found that is that the determining factor for whether a school is concerned about regulations or testing is how low income is the neighborhood that their school resides in. And th the more they are in a low income neighborhood, the less they are going to be concerned about testing and regulations, hmm. regardless of whether it's a Catholic school or a non-Catholic school, or whether it's a religious school or a non-religious school. The, the, the income of the neighborhood, in my experience, is the determining factor. That's I, mean, interesting. I, I have yeah. not thinking of a, a private school in a low-income area in Florida that doesn't want to participate in the program, and their desire is so strong that they are very, un, in my opinion, in my experience, they are very unconcerned about these aspects. Now, but as you go up the income scale in terms of the neighborhood, the schools tend to be more more concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And this is true whether it's a a non a non sectarian school or a Catholic school. I mean, I can think of some very high end Catholic schools in Florida that that don't participate in the tax credit program. So again, the main the main takeaway I had was that the income of the neighborhood is the determinant rather than the type of school. Hmm. That's really really interesting. We we do have schools telling us that one of the major reasons they don't participate is that there's not many students eligible in their vicinity. Uh, but what what do you think, John? I mean, are, are are schools being honest here, or is it that these upper end schools simply don't want to take? Uh, kids who are coming with all the challenges of poverty, that they're worried about whether they are going to be able to serve those students well and, and whether those kids are going to integrate well into the school. Well, I, I'm sure that is a concern of many of those schools. Um, we, we have several high-end schools in Florida. I wouldn't say many, but several of them that uh, as a matter of outreach and mission will, will take these students and to their credit, they take them at a significant loss mm -hmm. because uh, by law, by statute, our scholarship right now is limited to about $4,500 per kid. And, you know, the tuition that some of these schools can, a high-end school in Florida can cost fifteen, you know, $18,000. And yet we still have some schools, and I can think of some in, in my own hometown of Tampa, 
that do reach out and, and take a few kids. And I give them tremendous credit for doing that. Now, we have other schools that don't take any at all, and I'm sure they, they have some of the concerns that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's both a concern about cost and also a concern about, about culture that prevents these schools from, from reaching out. Now, John, the, the program that you run, uh, the Step Up for Students that you helped to found, uh, is, is we found the most regulated of the tax credit programs, and particularly when it comes to testing and accountability. And there's some worry out there, particularly as we transition to common core standards and testing, that we're going to, in effect, be holding these private schools accountable to these new national standards, national tests. Is this something you worry about? What, what do you say to people who say, you know what, we should just let the free market decide and should avoid any any focus on standards and accountability when it comes to this kind of testing? Well, the first thing I wonder about, and I'll be very curious to see, is whether market forces d dictate that the, the companies that now create the nationally recognized norm reference tests, whether market forces demand that those companies begin to test based on the common core. Hmm. You know, you know, right now in Florida, private schools that take tax credit kids must give either a nationally recognized norm reference test or the state test, the FCAT, and almost all of them give the former. Hmm. As we transition to Common Core, will parents who send kids to private schools demand to know how their children are doing in relation to the Common Core? And if so, will companies that, that create like the Stanford 10 or the Iowa Basic Skills be forced to, to assess under that rubric. I'll be very curious to see. So if that happens, this whole issue goes away and there, there will be no controversy. But another, another aspect I'm very interested in is whether states that demand private schools taking scholarship kids be tested under, under Common Core, whether those states are willing to fund the technology upgrades it's going to take to do the assessment. In Florida, all the assessment under Common Core for public schools is going to be online, right. and that's going to require a massive investment in the in the public schools. The state, if they just came out and said that private schools must immediately assess under Common Core standards, the private schools would have to invest millions in technology to comply. And again, many of our schools are schools in low-income areas that work miracles with very little money. They just don't have the funds to do that. Will the state be willing to, for example, perhaps increase the amount of the scholarship if they're willing to do the Common Core assessment? That'll be a very interesting policy debate. That's a great question. Well, and of course, beyond testing, too, it, it, there also raises a good point. In our study, what we did find was that private schools are concerned about some regulations more than others, and, and, and certainly one of uh, the concerns that a lot of private schools had in, in, in considering whether to participate in these programs is whether they could maintain their own admission standards. Uh, open enrollment is a big concern of, of a lot of private schools that we surveyed uh, when they considered to enter these programs. Uh, what do you think, John? Should private schools be able to, to maintain their own admission standards um, when they do participate in these programs, however regulated they might be? I do, and here's why I don't worry about that. When I when I read that concern in the report, again, I kind of had to laugh to myself because I was wondering you know, how many schools in low-income areas were surveyed. And again, I think that the reaction to this question is really dictated to where the schools are located. The schools in Florida, uh, the ones that are in low-income areas, which is the majority, uh, let me back up. One, one, one criticism that we often hear from opponents to parental choice programs is that they cream the best kids from the public schools. Well, we actually have data from the program in Florida that, that directly refutes that. And in fact, it's just the opposite. The report done by David Figlio showed that the Florida tax credit program is taking the poorest and the poorest performing children from the public schools. So if, if you were to survey you know, all these schools in Florida that are taking these kids and, and ask them, you know, are you concerned about maintaining your selective admissions policies? They would laugh. They would say, look, we reach out and take all comers and we take the hardest case kids, as is proven by this report. So I don't think it's a big concern for most of the schools that are, that are serving the kids in these programs. 
Right. Fascinating. So that, that's the consistent message again and again, John, is, is when we think about the kinds of schools participating in these programs, it's not these high-end independent schools. It's not the Sidwell Friends, like where the president has his daughters. It's much more likely to be in, in sort of inner city, urban, uh, Christian school or Catholic school, perhaps, uh, you know, or in some cases, non-sectarian, just scraping to get by and, and serving low-income kids. That is correct. Now, there you mentioned Citibel Friends. That's a great example of a school that did reach out under the Opportunity Scholarship Program in D.C. and serve kids on that program. And I give them tremendous credit for doing so. But until the voucher amounts or the tax credit scholarship amounts get large enough to create good uh, supply in huge numbers, it, it's, you're going to see that phenomenon. And, and that's one of my hopes is that uh, we will continue to see an increase in the per pupil per pupil scholarship amounts in these programs. All right. Well, John, John Kirtley, again, with Step Up for Students. John, we appreciate your time and, and very much all of your work on behalf of low-income students in the great state of Florida. Thank you, John. Pleasure Thank to be you, John. With you. Thanks, Thanks, John. So much. Thank you. All right, Adam. Very interesting stuff, huh? And, uh, you know, th this question about Common Core assessments in private schools, mm -hmm. such as in Indiana and in Ohio and other places, mm -hmm. Louisiana, where they have to take the state test. Really good question. It's a good uh, question, and it's probably going to change things in the ne in the course of the next few years. And you're starting to see a lot of Catholic school systems respond to this already. Yeah, It'll look, be I, I haven't that heard that anybody also. talk about this this challenge of technology. I, I can't imagine the states are planning to pay for that technology in those schools. So that's probably something we, we need to dig into.